Good evening, good day everybody and welcome to the 26th episode of the Indian Interest Podcast. I hope you are all doing very well. Before we begin the podcast, let me see who all is on the live chat, who all is atten- in attendance. I can see Jasman Raj Singh, Mathieu Perez, the guy, Trupti Patil, Peshwa Bajirav, Liger, AK, the guy, Sharon Lobo, XMTRA, Attitude Infinity, Tuti Futi, Ketan Vankede, Aditya Kumar Show, Alak, Ladha, Ketan Vankhede, Pratham, Priyanka, Siberian Husky, Privet, Feminist Slayer, Veg Chicken, that's wonderful, Prag Kumar, Ravi Dubey, Neve, Gaurav Bhatt, uh, Chiching, Sai Nikhil, Arnav Rai, Yash, Alak, Likhita, Paradwaj, Pavan Kumar, Ra Agent, Karan, Mukulita, Aman, Parth, Illuminati Creek, Srinu Bomi Sethi, O Lotus Abhishek Tripathi, AJ Raol, Debosman Das Gupta, Good Boy Shubham, Kushagra, Balram, Aman Sinha Shushrut, Yash Rao, Deepak, Des, Ankush, Arnav, Asminor, Divyang Patel, Lakshay Rajput, Daksh Vora, Umbrella Corporation, Song File, Cosmic Draw 7781, Kai, Dr. Surya Kant, Saket, Utpal, Monish, Pavan Kumar, Shavan Shetty, Chandan Avasti, Disha, Vishnu, Ronit, Mohit, Shiva, and lots of other people I can see. Dunde, Munna, Pranav, Jatin, Onkar, Shodit, Bharat, Jiu, No, Tsubba, Sa, 1176, Badri, Vishal, Ayush, and everybody else. Thank you so much for being on this live stream. I really appreciate it. And with that said, I can see some more. Harsh Zaveri, Arjun, and so on. Vladimir Adityanath, Namaste Ji, <laughs> Divya Agarwal. So, thank you so much for being on the live stream. I, I, live stream, I really appreciate it. And now, let's get into what we're going to talk about. So, what shall we talk about today? Lots of things to talk about. Let's begin with the uh, the banking crisis, the financial crisis that we are seeing in the United States. So, what's happening? Let's take. Uh, let's do a roundup of what's happened in the past week. Here we are. What does it say? Five big moments from the week that rocked the bank, this banking system. So this is uh, an article from March 17. Today is March 18 from yesterday. So what's been happening in the US? So Friday, March 10, <laughs> the Silicon Valley Bank collapses. So the Silicon Valley Bank is was a bank that was headquartered in Santa Clara, California. It collapsed on March 10. Uh, California regulators seized this bank on Friday, citing inadequate liquidity and insolvency as too many depositors tried to withdraw their money at the same time in a bank run, triggering the biggest bank collapse since the 2008 financial crisis. Then Sunday, March 12, another bank falls, Signature Bank, and the government steps in. March 13, Biden confirms that all the depositors of SVB and Signature will be safe, but not investors. The little guy will not be safe. The big guys will be safe, as as always, as usual. That's how it goes uh, in the US. Now, Wednesday, March 15, fears of global banking crisis grow after Credit Suisse stocks stumble. Credit Suisse is the second largest lender in Switzerland. Shares took a nose drive dive as fears of a global banking crisis spread. Uh, on Wednesday, the Saudi National Bank, which acquired an almost 10% stake in this bank, uh, said it would not increase its stake in order to stabilize the Swiss lender. That share that sent share prices plummeting to an all-time low for the second successive day. On the course of, over the course of the day, the share prices fell by 24%, and this affected stocks across the US, US markets and so on. <coughs> Thursday, March 16, uh, Credit Suisse and Flailing First Republic both thrown lifetime, lifelines. Uh, Credit Suisse announced it would borrow up to $54 billion from Switzerland's central bank uh, and so on. So that's the kind of stuff that's been happening. It's a, it's complete chaos in the markets in the US and in Europe and across the world. So that's what's happening there. I'll take a look at this. Look at this. So UBS seeks Swiss backstop in any Credit Suisse deal. UBS is the Union des Banques Suisses. It's a big uh, uh, Swiss banking uh, conglomerate, you could say. It's a, it, it used to be, a, it's, I mean, it, it's a union of various banks. Uh, so that is what's happening. They're trying to shore up 
Credit Suisse and and save that bank. Uh, like again, the same thing. UBS examining takeover of Credit Suisse to stem banking turmoil. Says report. This is from today itself. Now, what's interesting is Switzerland is getting involved in this in this mess. What happened to Switzerland? It used to be a very safe destination for international money. Safe as a Swiss bank. That's what they used to say. Well, look here. Switzerland has this reputation, this long-standing tradition policy of remaining neutral, geopolitically neutral. Now, look what happened. What happened last year, about a year ago, slightly more than a year ago, neutral Swiss joined EU sanctions against Russia in break with past. So they supported the US-led uh, led sanctions on Russia. They joined the sanctions. Switzerland broke its tradition, broke its policy of remaining neutral in everything, including the Second World War. The Swiss were neutral even during the hostilities of the Second World War. And over here, they have broken their tradition and their policy of neutrality, and they have supported and participated in the US-led sanctions against Russia. Big, big change that we are seeing. Sharp deviation from traditional neutrality. Uh, orders freeze of Swiss assets of people and firms on the list. Imposes sanctions on Putin and ministers. Bans entry of five oligarchs close to Putin. So Switzerland has adopted all the sanctions that the EU has imposed on Russian people and companies and all that. And obviously the EU sanctions are all, well, you could say, well, orchestrated by, from the US. So that's something the, the Swiss have done. They've broken their tradition. Once again, the same thing. Uh, Switzerland adopts EU sanctions against Russia. This is from last year, February 28. Interesting. Take a look at this. So, so uh, this is a Wikipedia article about Swiss neutrality. It goes back to the World Wars, World War One, World War II. Uh, it, its origins lie in the 16th century. So you, you can read the article if you're interested. As always, let me just remind you, Wikipedia cannot always be trusted, especially when it comes to India. Over here, it's it's you, probably fine. Uh, now look at this. This is an article from the Financial Times. Financial Times. This is the article. It says, Swiss banks say rich Chinese clients worried about sanction prospects. Bank executives highlight concerns about business fallout from country's tough line on Russia since Ukraine invasion. It's not a tough line. They've broken the tradition of neutrality. So people are worried now. Swiss banks say that rich Chinese clients worry about sanctions prospects. Many large Chinese clients stopped keeping their, bank, their money in Swiss banks because of Swiss sanctions against Russia. They fear the same if there's a conflict between China and the West, which means between China and the U.S., so that's something that Switzerland needs to worry about, should worry about. Uh, a U.S. diplomat based in Bern said officials in his office were keeping keeping a close eye on Chinese wealth in Switzerland. So it looks like the Chinese may be may be sharing details of of. Uh, uh, it looks like the Swiss may be sharing uh, details with the U.S. about Chinese uh, investments and Chinese wealth that is parked in Switzerland. So traditionally, Swiss banks were the safe haven where Anybody with a lot of money could go and park money. They would accept your money, no questions asked. That's why it, uh, well, allegedly, lots of Indian wealthy people, wealthy people, politicians, etc., allegedly uh, are are reputed to have stashed a lot of wealth in Switzerland. And the Swiss banks would ask no questions how you acquired the money from where you acquired it from. Nothing, no ask, no questions asked. You can simply deposit the money. Later on, they started uh, changing the policy somewhat. Uh, but now it's it's uh, trouble for the Swiss if, because they have broken their, tradi their tradition of neutrality, and uh, the credibility of Swiss, ne Swiss neutrality is is kind of you know on shaky ground these days. Uh, so yeah, that's all about the banking crisis, and and uh, this is one more piece of information that's come out. This is from yesterday. So. This is the Fed, the, the the Fed, the US Fed's balance sheet. As you can see, there's this, there's this sharp spike over here, which means that they have added $300 billion to their balance sheet. What this means is that they have printed $300 billion out of thin air. Let's understand 
what the US can do that others can't. The US dollar is the global reserve currency. It's accepted worldwide. And the only nation that can create or print US dollars is the United States. And their central bank is the Federal Reserve. This is the bank that can do it. So when it comes to the US, they can print unlimited amounts of money as per their wishes. Obviously, it's going to cause inflation. But that's that's the power that they have. So they have printed $300 billion worth of money. It could be Paper money, it could be electronic money, but there you have it. That's what they, they can do. So that's the difference between U.S. debt and other nations' debt. People ask this all the time. The U.S. has this incredible debt burden, incredible amounts of debt. How will they pay it back? They will not pay it back. They will never pay it back. Or they will pay it back by creating imaginary money, money like this and then paying you with that imaginary money. When it comes to India or China, if we have to, let's say gain or earn 300 billion dollars we have to provide that much value to to the to the world we have to manufacture goods and sell them or we have to uh, sell services and then in in exchange for that we get money worth whatever it is for the us it's just printing money or or creating money in in a computer that's that's as simple uh, that's how it is and obviously when you have, when you when you create excess money excessive amounts of money it causes inflation prices draw, uh, prices go up so uh prices go up because the value of money becomes becomes lesser and lesser as more currency or more money is available that's how it goes so this is uh, this this is something that milton friedman the very famous economist uh, said inflation is just like alcoholism in both cases when you start drinking or when you start printing too much money the good effects come first and the bad effects only come later so by printing this money incredible amounts of money they are simply staving off disaster for later but eventually disaster will come unfortunately that's the case so uh that is the deal that's what's happening right now in uh, the U.S. banking system. Banks are collapsing. Very prominent banks are in trouble. Swiss banks are in trouble. Uh, the world seems to be moving to a, closer to a recession. So yeah, trouble is afoot in the international economy. So we were talking about the Silicon Valley Bank. It's headquartered in California, Santa Clara, California. California is a wonderful place. One of the most wonderful states in the U.S. It was called what? The Sunshine State, the Golden State. It's on the west coast of the U.S. Let me not break out the map today. <laughs> it's on the west coast of the U.S., southwest coast of the U.S. Very nice climate, very nice weather. Lots of sunshine year-round. It's neither too hot nor too cold. It does snow in the north, etc. But overall, a wonderful place. You know, um, one of the best states to live in, in the US. And uh, of late, there's a lot of trouble in California. There's a lot of homelessness in places like Los Angeles, San Francisco. Homelessness, lots of crime, rampant crime, shoplifting, other stuff. Um, public services are in a state of, you know, in a bad state. So overall, California is, if you if you ask anybody who lives there, they will tell you that over the past decade, California has descended into chaos. California is nowhere close to what it used to be today. It's, it's, it's ever so slowly becoming kind of a hellhole. You know, if you go to San Francisco, Francisco California, uh, or, or Los Angeles, you will see that all many shops are, are boarded up. In, and uh, it's, it's very problematic, you know. There's, there's garbage all over the streets in some places, in some parts of town. There are homeless people all over the place. Uh, drug abuse is rampant. Things have gone really bad. What happened to California? Well, it's the people who are in power. It's It's been the Democrats who, are, who have been in power for quite some time. And one of these individuals was the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. So these days, this gentleman, Eric Garcetti, is in the news because he has been appointed and now confirmed 
as the next U.S. ambassador to India. Now, the position of the U.S. ambassador to India has been lying vacant for for quite some time, over two years. Let's let's take a look at the list of U.S. ambassadors to India and uh, see what we get. So this is once again Wikipedia. Here we are. List of ambassadors of the U.S. to India. So it's a long list. I'll not bore you with all the names and all the details. But let's take a look at what happened after, after Kenneth Juster. Kenneth Juster was ambassador of the U.S. until... Uh, to India until January 20, 2021. Then they did not appoint anybody. So there was Donald Heflin, who was the chargé d'affaires, then Daniel Bennett Smith, then Atul Keshap, who is uh, of uh, whose I believe whose father is Indian, then somebody else, then once again somebody else. And now this gentleman, Eric Garcetti, has been nominated and then confirmed as the U.S. ambassador to India. Now, he has not yet arrived in India. If you look at his uh, Twitter page, it still says mayor or something like that. So, this is uh, an article from 11th March, which is a week ago. So, he he was at that time a step closer to being the U.S. envoy to India. He was nominated by, by Joe Biden, the president. And he said that human rights will be the core of his engagement. Human rights in India will be the core of his engagement. And he will have direct engagement with groups fighting for human rights in India and civil society. So it's all about human rights and democracy. He's he's going to come to India and preach human rights and democracy. That is what he's going to do. Now let's take a look at some more uh, reports. Former LA Mayor uh, Garcetti's nomination to the to the ambassador to be ambassador to India confirmed by the U.S. Senate. The Senate voted, voted 52 to 40, 52 to 42, confirming his nomination. So now it's confirmed. And it was a close call, reasonably close, 52 to 42. Uh, so he is now the U.S., uh, he is now nominated and, and confirmed as the U.S. ambassador. Uh, he has been appointed the next U.S. ambassador to India. The job was vacant for 26 months, the longest stretch in the history of U.S.-India relations. And this is an article about that. Um, yeah. Now, this... Uh, and this is the response. This has been the response of the Indian government, the Ministry of External Affairs. We welcome the confirmation of Eric Garcetti as U.S. Ambassador to India. We look forward to working with him and take forward our multifaceted bilateral relations. That's what the Ministry of External Affairs spokesperson Arindam Bagchi said. This is from two days ago. Now, this is uh, his Wikipedia page. So let's take a look at this gentleman's career. I will not go into the details, but what I can tell you right off the bat, like they say, is that this guy is a low-level politician. Low-level means he has been the mayor of a city, of a big city, no doubt about it. But that's that's what he has done. He has not been the governor of, of a state. He, he was thinking of running for president in 2020. That's what we hear. But that's, the, that's what he has done. And this gentleman has zero experience as a diplomat no diplomatic experience whatsoever and he has been appointed the u.s ambassador to india imagine india appointing shahrukh khan as the ambassador to china or the u.s that's the kind of th deal they've done of course this guy's not an actor he's a imagine india appointing the mayor of some city of some reasonably big city to be the ambassador of india to the u.s or china or something like that does it make any sense a person with zero diplomatic experience being appointed ambassador. So clearly, the U.S. isn't really concerned about diplomacy when it comes to India-U.S. relations. He is being he is being sent to India with a certain specific agenda. And if you look at his political career, it becomes very clear that well, first of all, he is the he is a Democrat belonging to the Democratic Party. He is a liberal. You would call him a woke or whatever. Very liberal, very woke, liberal in the sense, you know, the, the political sense. Uh, so that's his background. And, and he, he has a very sketchy, dubious political record. So sexual harassment charges against a former aide follows Eric Garcetti to India. Uh, the allegations center not on Garcetti personally, but around his former aide, Rick Jacobs. Uh, so... 
His former communications director Naomi Seligman, a whistleblower in the sexual harassment saga, maintained in interviews that the former mayor Garcetti oversaw and enabled an office in which sexual harassment was ubiquitous. Means everyone did it, and this guy was the boss. So it's it's like impossible that he would not know about this. So he oversaw and enabled. Enabled is the word. It's a, it's a, it's a very potent word. He oversaw and enabled an office in which sexual harassment was ubiquitous. It was routine. It was rampant. Hmm? So, uh, so Seligman was direct, saying that Garcetti was undeserving of the ambassadorial assignment and she blasted the Biden administration and most Democratic lawmakers for ignoring the allegations. Well, they had this very big Me Too movement in which they said, believe the woman, trust the, trust any woman who, and believe her, anyone who makes these allegations. And what about Garcetti? Clearly double standards because the, the people who made the allegations, they have been totally sidelined and these allegations have been ignored. Uh, so it's, it further says that the, unfortunately, the White House put undue pressure on Democrats to vote for Eric Garcetti because he has been a very, very loyal person to President Biden. This is called what is it called? At at well, best thing you could say is 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 nepotism to some extent. Not really nepotism because nepotism is about family, but you see, it's favoritism. It's about rewarding someone's loyalty despite that person being you know a very problematic person. So um, so the democratic leadership reposed full faith in this man. Because he's seen as being close to President Biden. And obviously, he is being he has been handpicked because he's gonna serve a certain agenda in India. Uh, so Senate confirms Garcetti is ambassador to India amid controversy over handling of sexual misconduct misconduct claims. This is by Forbes. Uh, LA mayor likely knew about the alleged sex misconduct. Once again, the same story. Eric Garcetti barely survived political ruin some of more of the same and obviously this if you look at if you read this article it will tell you that there was much more there were all kinds of scandals in LA during his reign as the mayor of LA uh, LA Los Angeles descended into into I mean, well you know uh, it was one of the best cities in the US it's because it's it's kind of become a hellhole it's it's inching towards that status today uh, all under his 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 reign as mayor uh this is what Sagar Injiti has to say. He is a political analyst in the US and co-host of a, a podcast, a couple of podcasts. He says the entire Garcetti nomination is further Biden administration insult to New Delhi. He is both a useless former mayor and one who covered up sexual harassment. Worse, Biden refused to withdraw his nomination and preferred nobody to him. Which, which And that's the reason why the position was vacant for over two years or for about 26 months. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff they are pushing on India, you know, um, all that woke nonsense. So that's that's what the U.S. is enabling India the, in India, the U.S. embassy to India. Uh, and this is only going to intensify with the arrival of Mr. Garcetti to India. What else? And w here's more. Huge red flag. Inside Biden nominee Eric Garcetti's ties to members of alleged Chinese intel front groups. So apparently he was very close to various Chinese agents in the US, you could say spies in the US, which kind of makes him a potential or possible Chinese agent himself, Garcetti. And you know what, what the allegations are about even the Biden uh, family's closeness to various Chinese intelligence groups and other dubious things. So, so this guy is going to have a certain agenda pushed by the US government, an anti-India agenda. And not only that, he is also possibly a Chinese agent. Well, what a wonderful cocktail we've got here. Intersection, you know, what is it? Intersectionality or whatever they call it. <laughs> so, so that's about this guy. There's more. So US confirms Garcetti as ambassador to India, a Trojan horse in action. He claimed that he will raise human rights, the human rights issue in India by engaging with activists on the ground. Human rights will be a core part of Garcetti's engagement, not US-India relations, not taking the relationship forward. Human rights. He's here to preach human rights and interfere in India's internal matters and in, in put his nose everywhere where it doesn't belong. 
So, uh, what does it say? Bringing fact blatantly India into India ploy, human rights issue, and democracy. He spoke about concerns about apparent condition of Indian minorities. The U.S. has falsely and openly claimed that the Citizen Amen- Citizenship Amendment Act is discriminatory against minority groups. And the incoming U.S. envoy has expressed, uh, has said that he will raise the issue. So this tells you what, what this guy is all about. Um, he has worked closely with Amnesty International, another extremely problematic organization that is a, that is purpose built to you know, interfere in various nations' internal affairs. Uh, it peddles lies and spreads misinformation about India. So Garcetti has worked closely with an, uh, Amnesty International. He has close and deep ties with Chinese intelligence groups. He has uh, received lots of money from these groups. So, uh, I mean, it's kind of confirmed more or less that he is a Chinese agent or at least has benefited from his closeness to Chinese intelligence agents and all that. So this is part of the uh, Breaking India 2024 campaign, essentially. Until now, they did not care about uh, nominating a, a US uh, an ambassador to India. And now they've nominated this person with zero diplomatic experience, but who is closely connected to Chinese intelligence and who has a very clear anti-India agenda. When they talk about human rights and democracy, it's about interfering in the internal affairs of other nations. That's what it is. And it is also done through NGOs and various other these so-called civil society groups and all that. That's typically NGOs. Let's talk about NGOs. NGOs are weapons in hybrid war. Ex-Russian President Dmitry Medvedev. The organizations often seek to stir civil unrest while claiming to pursue noble goals. Dmitry Medvedev insisted. Well, he is right. NGOs, I mean, in India, I think billions of dollars are funneled into various anti-India activities through NGOs in India itself. Uh, This is Rebecca Chan, who is most likely a Chinese Communist Party agent on Twitter, but she's right over here. He or she, I mean, whatever it is. Uh, Foreign agents hide in NGOs. They were crawling all over Hong Kong before the US-backed riots in 2014 and 2019. Well, think about some riots in India around 2019, around the same time. Remember when President Trump visited India, New Delhi. What was going on in New Delhi? Th- th- try and connect the dots. Uh, so, yeah. So, NGOs is what they use. And India has, I don't know, there are more NGOs in India than schools. There are more NGOs in India than hospitals. That's how many NGOs in India are, are there in India. It's an incredibly lucrative business. Nothing else. And some, I'm not saying all, but some of these NGOs receive copious, abundant quantities of foreign funding. And uh, well, if you look into where the funding comes from, you, you will see certain patterns. And these NGOs typically, some, well, some of these are, are connected with lo- all kinds of anti-India activities that uh, seek to destabilize India, malign India's reputation, make India look bad internationally by by, by lying, by claiming, by misrepresenting facts and, 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 you know, all these distortions and falsehoods. And the objective is to destabilize India, make India weaker, create divisions in Indian society. And there are plenty of tools for them to do that with, not just NGOs, but other tools as well. Uh, Georgia almost got tap- toppled for saying no to NGOs. <laughs> so, yeah, there was an attempted color revolution in NGO uh, in, in Georgia very recently. I think it's still kind of somewhat smoldering and it's not, it may not be uh, a closed case yet, even though Georgia repealed those laws. But there you have it. And I've been saying this for the longest time. The 2023 is an extremely important pivotal year for India because it's the build-up to the 2024 general elections and the US would very much want a weaker government to come to power in India, a coalition mixed-up government with no real agenda, a common minimum program, and they would not want Mr. Modi to remain in power in 2024. That's what that's the ideal situation, the, the great dream of theirs. So if there is a weak government then they have the deepest pockets in the world and they can influence it and then they can turn India India into a US proxy. Firstly, to use India against China and secondly, to open up India's market for dumping their products and extracting money out of India. So, a golden goose and, uh, and, a, and, and uh, you know, a counterbalance to China. Now, we definitely welcome US help when it comes to uh, counterbalancing China from India's 
national interest perspective because china is a great threat to everybody in asia including to us but uh, we will not the the indian government does not want to be to india to be used in any which way the the us wants india will cooperate when it comes with the us when it comes to india's national interest so as long as it serves india's national interest we will cooperate not otherwise so when it comes to geopolitics and strategic affairs india will give issue based cooperation but if the government uh, loses the next election in 24 and a weak coalition government comes to power then as long as the us uh, fulfills certain needs of theirs they will <laughs> give a blank check to the us check to the us so that's the great dream so that's why we are seeing uh, the, all this uh, all these activities happening first of all india is being maligned uh, on social media there was a huge intense campaign against india last year about a year ago when india refused to take the us side in the ukraine conflict there were all these what i call disposable minions on social media think tank experts and uh, and 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 journalists and columnists who were writing all kinds of anti india articles people tweeting uh, about india even people that indians perceive as as being pro india they were saying that you know india has done the wrong thing india uh, by 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 supporting putin or not or not condemning putin you made the wrong choice comrades and things like that you know so there was a big concerted camp campaign at the time and this campaign will once again pick up speed it will intensify they're going to start maligning the indian government they're going to start maligning prime minister modi and india's uh, in, uh, in, you know uh, international policy india's internal affairs whatever in, internal policy we have all of this is going to be there's going to be a big campaign about this it's it's just warming up let mr garcetti come to india and let's see then in the next few months what starts happening so uh victoria newland has been involved in this you know stealth sanctions against india so you know what happened last year right for for a chinese person to apply for a us visa it, it would the the approval would take two days but for an indian it will take two and a half years or five years 17 years what whatever the number was uh what did it say over here yeah A, a communist chinese citizen can get a visa for travel to the us in 2 or 3 days but a citizen of india has to wait for 2 or 3 years for the privilege that's what the situation was like last year and it was all done by this wonderful lady uh, victoria newland and this art uh, and it was also about not just the ukraine war but india purchasing the s400 system from russia and all that and mr madhav dalapat who wrote this article was in favor of india ditching the s400 uh, system so he was in in favor of uh, of what the us was saying so that is the deal that's what's happening uh, when it comes to uh, the appointment of mr garcetti it's not a it's not an isolated event it's part of a bigger plan for india from the us perspective so uh, it's going to be interesting when once he reaches india india is not going to reject his nomination there's no point doing that they will send somebody even worse so he's going to be the next ambassador of the us to india a person with zero diplomatic experience is going to be the us ambassador to one of the biggest and most important nations in the world what does this tell you so there is an agenda there so that's about mr garcetti the next us ambassador to india now let's talk about what's happening closer home we were talking about the us now, now let's talk about ukraine and russia so uh, what is happening vis-a-vis -vis ukraine and russia so there's an interesting piece of news that's come out the there is this thing called the international criminal court in the netherlands in the hague and here's what they are up to <laughs> so international criminal court issues warrant for vladimir putin arrest warrant for vladimir putin over ukraine war crimes they have issued an arrest warrant on friday against russian president vladimir putin accused him of being responsible for war crimes committed in ukraine but moscow said the move was meaningless now let's see here so this is from the bbc arrest warrant issued for putin over war crimes allegations uh this is the website of the international criminal court itself situation in ukraine icc judges issue arrest warrants against vladimir vladimirovich putin and maria alex uh, alexeyevna lvova belova whoever she is uh now uh so this is yes yeah, so so the us president 
Mr. Biden has welcomed the ICC's war crimes charges. He's, uh, Mr. Biden is pretty happy about this. Uh, now, this is interesting. So, Mr. Biden is quite happy about the fact that the International Criminal Court has uh, issued an arrest warrant against Mr. Putin. They're, Mr. Biden is happy. The US is happy. This is from September 2020. The International Criminal Court officials, uh, its officials were sanctioned, sanctioned by the US. Let's let's take a look at this story. It's, it's quite interesting. The US has imposed sanctions on senior officials in the International Criminal Court, including uh, this lady. Chief Prosecutor, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo accused the court of illegitimate attempts to subject Americans to its jurisdiction. So the U.S. stand is that the ICC, International Criminal Court, does not have jurisdiction over the United States or its citizens. And the ICC was investigating whether U.S. forces <laughs> committed war crimes in Afghanistan. All right. All right. So what else did they say? Uh, Mr. Pompeo said that Ms. Bensuda and whoever else, the head of the jurisdiction, complementarity, all that, were to be sanctioned against this order. He dismissed the ICC as a thoroughly broken and corrupted institution. The United States dismissed the International Criminal Court as a thoroughly broken and corrupted institution. He said that those who continued to materially support those individuals risk exposure to sanctions as well. So let's understand what jurisdiction the International Criminal Court has. This was created by a UN treaty in 2002. The ICC investigates and apparently brings to justice those responsible for genocide or crimes against humanity, war crimes, and intervene. it intervenes when national authorities cannot or will not prosecute. This treaty has been ratified by 123 countries including the United Kingdom. But the US, along with China, India, and Russia, has refused to join. And some African nations have accused the body of being unfairly focused on Africans. Interesting. So the US does not recognize the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, but they are happy about what's happening over here. Let's take a look at this. So this is the Wikipedia page for the ICC, International Criminal Court. Uh, court. And let's take a look at this image. Uh, all you have to see is is the green. So the green uh, the green countries, the countries coded in green color over here, they are the ones that are uh, what do they call it? The state parties. They they recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC, and everyone else does not recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC, including the US and Russia and China and India. So. The ICC arrest warrant has no meaning because it, it, it doesn't apply. It has no jurisdiction in Russia and in the majority of the world, actually, as, as you can see over here. So the majority of the world's population, if you look at this map, does not recognize the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And the US it, itself has said that this is a deeply, uh, a, what is a thoroughly broken and corrupted institution. All right. Uh, so that's interesting. Now, the, now, this is something I spoke about earlier as well. The Pentagon blocked... Mr. Biden and his, his administration from sharing evidence with the ICC, the Hague Court, uh, of possible Russian war crimes because it would open up the US and its citizens to, to the same charges. Well, they know what the US has done in the past. So, you know, uh, it, military leaders fear setting a precedent that might pave its way, the way for it to prosecute Americans. So even though they don't recognize the jurisdiction of the court, they do not want to set the precedent uh, for the, which would open up the court to prosecuting Americans. And like it's very clear over here, the Pentagon is clearly way more powerful than the White House. It can block something the White House is doing. The White House is the democratically elected administration of the US president. And it is less powerful than the, than the faceless, nameless Pentagon, the deep state. So that tells you what kind of nation the U.S. truly is. I mean, it, it became very clear after the appointment of Mr. Biden as president, the, the election of Mr. Biden as president, and, and uh, what's her name? Kamala Harris as the vice president, two of the most incompetent individuals we have ever seen. So when they became president and vice president respectively, it became clear that they are in no position to run a country. So somebody else is running it clearly, 
And that obviously seems to be the Pentagon and the deep state. And over here from this news report, it's very clear that the Pentagon has way more power and authority than the democratically elected president and his administration. So the US is, so the relationship between the Pentagon and the White House is exactly the same as the relationship between Rawal Pindi and Islamabad. The Pakistan army actually runs the country and owns the country. It's quite similar to what you have in the US. Uh, so yeah. Now, uh, the US also has something called the Hague Invasion Act. So in case the, the International Criminal Court uh, you know, tries to prosecute Americans, then the, the US can actually invade the Hague. You know, it's called the American Service Members Protection Act, informally known as the Hague Invasion Act. It's a law, a bill to protect US military personnel and other elected and appointed officials of the US government against criminal prosecution by an international criminal court to which the US is not party. So the US is very clear about it, the fact that it does not recognize the ICC, International Criminal Court. And yet, uh, this is what's happening. So they are happy when the, the ICC targets Putin and others, but they will not allow the ICC to target them. Now, this entire thing is farcical. The ICC targeting Putin for alleged war crimes. Because, well, this, this tweet makes a lot of sense. These three American men have invaded nine countries in 23 years, killed 11 million civilians, and no one calls them war criminals. And the ICC will, will stay far, far away from any sort of prosecution of three, these three gentlemen. Uh, the West wants to take Vladimir Putin to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. At the same time, Barack Obama dropped 26,000 plus bombs during his presidency and received the Nobel Peace Prize. So, you know, <laughs> that, that's that's how it goes. And so some people would say this is what about or what aboutism? Why, why are you talking about others? Let's let's focus on Putin. So this lady is absolutely right over here, Caitlin Johnston. It's not what aboutism to say it's absurd to charge Putin with war crimes without charging Bush. It's a completely devastating argument against the claim being made. If the law does not apply to everyone, then it is not the law. It is corruption. It is the tool. It is a tool of the powerful. So that is what it is. The so-called rules-based international order is not based on rules or laws. It's based on wishes and whims. It, it is a tool of the powerful. It is not law. It is just corruption. A law is supposed to op apply equally to everybody. And that's not that's clearly not, not what's happening here. So it's not about supporting Putin or supporting Russia or whatever. It's about fairness, inequality, and justice, the, it, which is clearly it de clearly doesn't exist in the so-called international order. So yeah. That's about Mr. Putin and the International Criminal Court, and it's it's a it's a pressure tactic which is actually going to amount uh, which which doesn't really have any real value because most of the powerful nations, India, China, U U.S., Russia, etc., they don't recognize the authority and the jurisdiction of the ICC. It's it's simply a pressure tactic that's that's being applied. Now let's talk about drones. Let's talk about drones. So. Uh, Here's what happened recently. The, the Russians uh, brought down a U.S. drone. Where's the, re where's the report? MQ-9 Re Reaper. So this drone crashed in the Black Sea. And we know where the Black, Black Sea is. Hopefully we do. Should I bring the map, up, map out? Let's not do it today. So a MQ-9 Reaper drone belonging to the U.S. Air Force crashed into the Black Sea when it was intercepted by two Russian Su Sukhoi 27 fighter jets near the Crimean Peninsula. So, uh, leading to tensions between the two countries, this is the first documented physical contact between the Russian and U.S. military forces since the war began, the invasion of U Ukraine began. The U.S. released footage of a Russian jet crashing into its MQ-9 drone. So, this is a, a grab from the footage. It shows a Sukhoi 27 fighter plane releasing fuel. You can see that stuff in, in its wake, fuel. Let's take a look at this. This is from the Kiev Post, which is uh, it's on Twitter. So let's take a look at this. This is from the drone itself, a camera from the drone. You can see the Sukhoi approaching. It's it's dumping fuel on the on the Reaper, and you can see the Reaper's propeller over here. And then there's another one, another Sukhoi that approaches. It also releases fuel, and then the camera cuts off. The camera cuts off. 
so uh, some would say that maybe the sukhoi collided with the mq9 reaper drone and and damaged its propellers or something like that and and some would some are even saying that the release of the fuel is what destroyed the drone uh right so that's what happened now uh, the russian navy has reached the crash site of the us uh, of the mq9 surveillance drone and they're going to most likely salvage it if they have already not done that so they have cordoned off the area essentially with a bunch of warships a large number of warships and they will most likely recover salvage the drone and then investigate its technology and all that um so this it appears that this drone was very close to crimea way closer to crimea than was previously reported by the us department of defense and uh, this person says after seeing this i'm honestly surprised the su27 did not just shoot it down so let's take a look at this geo confirmed uh, twitter account which has spoken about this Uh, the us released a statement about the reaper drone that was hit by a sukhoi 27 fighter russia claimed it did not come into contact with it who is lying it's not about who's lying but let's take a look at what happened uh so the russians did not use weapons that was that's what the russians claim did not come into contact you know physical contact with the uav and returned safely to the home base the americans are saying that it was intercepted and hit by a russian aircraft resulting in a crash well you know when a fighter plane hits another plane it re- typically destroys both aircraft so that's strange now this is the footage we'll not go into that this is the drone and the cameras where they are positioned this is at least one sukhoi which is releasing all this fuel um so there's more of that it is kind of trying to geolocate the incident the location of the incident you can see uh the north on the on the on the image of the of which is a screen grab from the drone's video and all of that so uh and then the the image cuts off and over here the propeller seems to be earlier it was fine over here it seems to be damaged so did the drone's uh, did the sukhoi's fuel hit the propeller and and damage it or did the did the sukhoi actually hit the propeller that's the question and then you can see a landmass over here in the image and they have been able to geolocate it with these mountains or hills whatever it is on the crimean peninsula which tells you that that this is the rough the the roughly the the region where this incident happened rough estimation and uh, yeah they have kind of constructed a sequence of events geographically as to where this happened and they have even been able to estimate the time the local time based on the reflection of the sun and all that so between 8 am and 9 am local time morning of 14th march uh, so that is what happened and they are claiming that the russians have been lying that the transponder of off was off even if it, if it was off it was in international waters and it clearly seems to be within international waters maybe within, within the exclusive economic zone and all that but that's what it is so this is the incident that happened it has definitely not caused a significant rise in tensions between the two militaries right now what's happening in ukraine let's understand ukraine was defeated in the first weeks in the first weeks of the special military operation ukraine was defeated what we are seeing now is a war between the russians and the nato forces that's what we are really seeing so this is an escalation uh, last week there was even this uh, uh a very heavy military plane a strato fortress that was on its way towards uh, an american plane a strategic bomber on its way to st petersburg and it uh, simulated a bombing run or or a nuclear missile run on st petersburg and then it it turned back so the americans have been pushing the limits of what they can do and what they can get away with in this region imagine russians sending drones in in the gulf of mexico or of the california coast will the americans allow that no they will shoot it down but the russians are are expected to allow this because it is apparently over international waters and all that so this is what is happening right now so this was an interesting incident that happened thankfully it has not really uh ramped up the tensions but you can see that uh, there's a lot of activity going on over here uh right that, that's that's the deal with the uh, the the 
US drone that was shot or that was brought down by the Russians in one way or the other uh, in the Black Sea. Now let's talk about Australia. Australia is re relatively closer to us. It's uh, in the Indian Ocean. Well, Western Australia is, in the, is, is adjacent to the Indian Ocean. So Australia had this submarine deal with France. They were supposed to buy a bunch of uh, French submarines, Scorpion submarines, a, a different version than what we have. So they had signed the agreement. The agreement was signed and, and sealed and all that. And then they broke the agreement, the, the, the finished, completed agreement. And they decided to purchase U.S. submarines instead, nuclear submarines instead. So they backstabbed France. France obviously is extremely unhappy about this. No, I mean, no wonder. So let's take a look at, at what's what's happening here. Uh, so now there is more clarity about the AUK-US deal, uh, which is the submarine deal. So this is a tweet by Mr. Grossman. The AUK-US announcement preview sounds like five Virginia-class submarines for Australia. Australia expected to buy up to five Virginia-class US nuclear submarines as part of this this deal the auk us pact it will have multiple stages with at least one us submarine visiting australian ports in the coming years it will end in the late 2030s with a new class of submarines being built by with british designs and american technology so australia the uk and us are all involved in this so the australians have shut the door on france and they've gone for this deal AUK-US confronts inflection point in history with $368 billion submarine deal. Can you imagine the amount of money? It's not $368 million. It's $368 billion, this deal. It's a staggering, shocking amount of money that the Australians will pay to the US. It's, it's ridiculous. It's incredible. Australia's nuclear submarine plan to cost up to 245 billion by 2055. Over here is 368 billion. So it's clearly an, an incredibly expensive deal. Uh, former ambassador to the US, Joe Hockey, says on why the 368 million dollar sub announcement is not too costly. The cost of failure is far greater than the cost of investment. Uh, and here's what Caitlin Johnston has to say about this. He's lying. The calculation, oh here, see, the calculation is that the cost of disobeying the Americans is marginally greater than the suffering they will endure as their proxy in their war with China. The $368 billion is our pizza with the US. Pizza means protection money paid to the mafia in the form of a formed of a forced transaction of transfer of money resulting from extortion. Uh, so this is called protection money in Italy. Pizzo. Protection money is a concept that every culture, every nation has in some form of the, of the other. In India, they call it hafta. Hafta is, is, this word is derived from the Sanskrit saptaha. It means week. So hafta is protection money that you would pay once a week. You pay it today, you're good to go for a week until next week. And if you don't pay, there will be consequences. So that's called protection money. So essentially what Caitlin Johnston is saying, that the $368 billion the, Amer the Australians will pay to the US is protection money. The cost of disobeying the Americans is marginally greater than the suffering they will endure as their proxy in their war of, against China. So China can do less harm to Australia than the, than the Americans. Essentially that's what she is saying and we are screwed if we do it, screwed if we don't. Excuse the language. So that's what she is saying and she obviously is correct. Um, and then there's this thing. There's been a long recognition that US submarines are difficult for Australians to operate as they are a quantum leap in size and crew requirements. The Australians will be dependent on American crewing for a long time, which means the submarines will be American and they will be crewed with by American soldiers or, or crew people, crewmen, crew women, crew they them, whatever the various genders that the Americans have. But yeah, so even the personnel inside the submarines will be mostly American for a very long time. Here it is, Australia out of its depth with US subs, Ward's expert. So 
Australia will have to rely heavily on you on, on America to crew nuclear submarines for a long time if it buys these subs and it's gonna buy the subs. And here's a nice cartoon about this. Between it's a hypothetical conversation between Joe Biden and Rishi Sunak, the president of the US and the president of the Prime Minister of the UK. Then Rishi or Rishi, we told the Aussie guy that we wanted to park our China attack subs in his country and he should pay US, he should pay us $368 billion for the privilege. And he agreed. So that's essentially what's happening. These submarines are, are going to be American submarines. It will have American crew. Most likely the, the, the weapons will also be, the, 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 the button, the red button will also be under US control. So it's Australian only in name, but Australia is going to pay for the privilege. It's like the it's like the UK's nuclear deterrent. The UK has nuclear submarines and they have nuclear warheads, but those warheads are placed are mated to American missiles, ballistic missiles. And I can assure you, it's not going to be Mr. Rishi Sunak who has got the big red button for launching those nuclear missiles. It's going to be somebody in the US. Clearly not Biden. So that is the game that's being played here. So France is deeply upset. They have been backstabbed. They have been screwed over, like they would say. They are deeply upset that the Americans have done this to them. So here's what's happening now. France, this is a report from December 2021. France set to offer Barracuda nuclear submarines to India. So this is something that was brewing in 2021. Let's move fast forward a little bit. This is from March 6, 22, which is two weeks ago, roughly. France looks to equip Indian Navy with cutting-edge submarines, heavyweight torpedoes, but Russian action delays the plan. So the Ukraine thing is going on, but the French want to offer a, you know, submarines with, with uh, the best possible torpedoes to India. And possibly a new a new kind of submarine based on their original designs, the, the, the Barracuda class, the, the Barracuda nuclear submarines. They call it the Suffren, the Souffron nuclear submarines. Uh, so here we have, after AUK US, in another jolt for China, France offers India deal to make six nuclear submarines. This is from two or three days ago. If Indian Navy goes ahead with this proposal by France, it will be another feather in the cap of the Atman Nirbhar Bharat initiative of the Indian government led by Prime Minister Modi. So these submarines will be built in India. That's the deal. So the Indian Navy is undergoing a modernization process. We need more submarines. I've been saying this for a very long time. So six nuclear attack submarines and that that's great. Uh, so the French offer to India includes this, the overhauled design. It's it's an improved design based on its Barracuda class submarine for a new submarine class. So it's going to be based on their existing Barracuda class, but it's going to be a new class of submarines. It's going to be an enhanced, a better version of their Barracuda class. The new submarine will feature pump jet propulsion along with a 190 megawatt pressurized water reactor, nuclear reactor, which is currently being developed by state-owned nuclear company BARC, Baba Atomic Research Center, Mumbai, in consultation with Russian state-owned companies. What does this mean? They will offer us the design and the, and the, the, the new class, but they will not offer India the nuclear propulsion, the nuclear reactor. They, they may offer it, but we clearly don't want it. We are developing our own nuclear reactor you know, miniaturized pressure, pressurized water nuclear reactor at BARC Bombay, Mumbai. And we, we India already has the ability to, to build nuclear reactors. India has nuclear technology. So why go for that? We can do it on our own. So we'll get the submarine, but we will install the nuclear reactor ourselves of our own design. The ones that they have are 150 megawatt nuclear reactors. Our reactor, the Indian one, is going to be 190 megawatts, a more powerful nuclear reactor. So that's the deal. Now, obviously, there will be negotiations as about the technology transfer and all that. How much technology will be transferred by the French to India? What kind of technology will be transferred? The French, well, they have historically been very cagey about transferring too much technology. Technology comes at a cost. They We, we already op operate six Scorpion submarines. Uh, French designs and uh, some aspect of the technology have not been transferred to India when it comes to those scorpions. 
So it's all about negotiation right now. I hope that the Indian government doesn't waste too much time or take too much time negotiating. I mean, I, it, does, it should not go on for years and years like it typically does. That's a bureaucratic process. Take a year or two and finalize all the all the all the all the entire deal and and get on with it. So if we get the deal today. We will have the submarines by 2032, 2033, about a decade. It takes time to, to build these submarines. So assuming a couple of years of negotiations until, let's say, 2025, then you could get the submarines by 2035. So, you know, that's a very long time. So we need to get going with this thing. So I think it's a very good thing for India. The Americans have stabbed, and, 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 and the Australians and the, um, and the British have stabbed Australia and uh, France in the back. And the French obviously are deeply unhappy with this and they would like to give some payback, payback and they would like to make money elsewhere. So what better option than India? So I think it's a great opportunity for India. We need to negotiate hard with them, get the technology as much as we can and install our own nuclear reactor in the thing, in the boat. And that's great for us. And overall, long term, we should... Uh, build our own submarines based on these existing designs as you know with with improved uh as with improved versions so that's what needs to happen so i think it's a wonderful thing for india that the french are now very keen on on, on offering these submarines to india nuclear submarines uh so let's see where this goes and where 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 this deal takes us so it's good for india it's it's clearly not not good news for china but that's fine now let's talk about human rights. <laughs> let's talk about human rights. So human rights and, and, and democracy is something the, the Western world likes to spread worldwide. But when it comes to certain nations, they don't talk about human rights and democracy. Talk about, let's, let's think about the Middle East. The US has many client states in the Middle East. And when it comes to those nations, they, they disregard the concept of human rights and democracy. Talk about. Let's think about Saudi Arabia as an example. Saudi Arabia is not a democracy. Clearly, it's a monarchy. They have kings. There's no democracy there. The Americans are perfectly happy with that. They have been perfectly happy about this for decades. Doesn't matter if there's no democracy there. Human rights, let's not even talk about human rights in Saudi Arabia. right? So human rights and democracy, when it comes to uh, U.S., Client states, satellite states don't matter. But now they suddenly matter. What's happening? Uh, so let's let's take a look at this, these developments, human rights in democracy. So we know what's been going on with Mr. MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the, the crown prince, the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia. So in 2018, there was this incident, the Jamal Khashoggi incident, in which uh, a Saudi dissident was apparently murdered and uh, disposed the body was disposed of in a particularly gruesome manner in a saudi embassy i think it was in turkey in istanbul constantinople i believe it was and the americans made a big deal out of that you know i mean dissidents are are dealt with all across the world in every nation including in the us but in this case the americans made a, made a big deal out, out of it the uh, the democratic party especially went after Mr. Mohammed bin Salman. Biden was very harsh, harshly critical of Mohammed bin Salman. And the repercussions were quite quite strong for MBS. So in the 2019 V20 summit, you can see he was totally sidelined. As you can see in this image, let me embiggen it. He, he is definitely one of the major world leaders. And you can see how he has been sidelined in this image. This is, uh, this is another, the, the Buenos Aires uh, G20 summit. Once again, you can see how he has been sidelined and, and pushed to the side. So in these G20 summits, nobody spoke with him. None of the world leaders spoke with him. I think Prime Minister Modi was the only person who, who spoke with Mr. Mohammed bin Salman and, and, and was warm towards him. Everybody else cold-shouldered Mr. Mohammed bin Salman. So MBS is now... Try, he, as this article tells you, he's test driving a non-aligned foreign policy. What's happened is that the US is now self-sufficient when it comes to petroleum, to oil and gas. It doesn't need oil and gas anymore from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was the major supplier historically. Now the US 
produces its own oil and gas. So it doesn't need this anymore. So Saudi Arabia kind of has become disposable to the US. Now recently, as we know, there was this uh, inflation going on in the US last year or something. And the Americans wanted the Saudis to ramp up oil production. And the Saudis did not bow to US pressure and they actually cut down on oil production. The Americans are extremely unhappy. They are livid with Saudi Arabia about this matter. Saudi Arabia has expressed its desire to join BRICS, which is the opposite camp. It's India, Russia, China and other nations. Many nations want to join BRICS. So this again is a red flag for the US. They don't like this. The Saudis have gone ahead with the peace. Well, they have reopened, uh, re-established diplomatic relations with Iran, which is the, the Americans uh, consider Iran to be their sworn enemy. So once again, this is a red flag. The Americans are not happy about this. So now what's happening after all of this, now that the Saudis are are, are, are worried about, I mean, they are, they are embarking upon what you would call a non-aligned or multi-aligned foreign policy. They no longer want to remain a client state of the US. Now what's happening? Let's take a look at this. US senators introduced bipartisan resolution to establish report on Saudi Arabia human rights record. Until for decades, there were no concerns in the US about human rights or democracy in Saudi Arabia. But now, this is March 15th, that's like three days ago. Now they are suddenly very concerned about human rights in Saudi Arabia. US senators adopt new strategy to put to push Saudi Arabia on human rights. This is again March 15th. So now suddenly the old bogey of human rights and soon democracy, I'm sure, will be opened. The big can, the big box will be opened, and the all the tools in the toolkit will be will be brought out. Will be brought out to pressurize Saudi Arabia. No surprise there. So this is what's happening with Saudi Arabia. It's gonna be tough days ahead for the Saudis. It, they, you could even witness an attempted color revolution or an attempted regime change in Saudi Arabia. It is possible. This could just be the prelude to all of that. So, yeah. So, human rights and democracy may soon be visiting Saudi Arabia. Now, here's something else. Mexico. Mexico has discovered lithium. Mexico becomes the ninth country to find lithium reserves as demand increases. This is from November last year. All right. So Mexico discovered lithium. I am, it, I'm I'm not sure how much it says. 25,000 tons to 100,000 tons in 2021. So, yeah. So it says the uh, Latin America holds 63% of the world's uh, reserves and all of that. So lithium is in high demand because of because it's an essential component in lithium ion batteries that are being used worldwide, including you know cell phones and laptops and all your devices and and Tesla cars and electric vehicles and all that. So Mexico has discovered lithium. Mexico moves to nationalize lithium production among, amid potential boom, which means the government will control the lithium reserves. They will not invite foreign private companies or, or Mexican private companies, which will be proxies of foreign nations, to do this thing. The government itself will control the lithium production, the Mexican government, so that it benefits Mexico, not other nations. So this is a report from 2021. Mexico's President Andres Manuel López Obrador orders the ministry ministry to step up lit, lithium nationalization. Lit, Mexico as a nation is going to own its lithium. Nobody else will own it. All right. Uh, so now the, you will see all this analysis that comes up on Reuters and all. Lithium experts are skeptical on success of Mexico's state-run miner, which means they are saying that the Mexican government should not run this. They should invite private companies to come in and do it. Either Mexican companies, which will have big stakes, you know, big, many of the significant portions of, of these companies will be owned by other nations or other companies belonging to other nations, or maybe bring in international companies, maybe American companies to, to mine the lithium. That's better, right? Mexico, world's largest, largest lithium reserve set to be mined by company Bacanora, despite concerns of negative environmental impacts. Now, this is another bogey they will raise, environmental in, impacts. So if India wants to develop a port in the Andaman Nicobar Islands, you will see Indian NGOs and civil rights activists and civil society and international uh, Greenpeace, etc. talking about environmental impact. When other nations in the West do such things, no, everybody is quiet. So now Mexico is being targeted when it comes to concerns about environmental impacts, right? Uh, and then we have this. 
Senator Lindsey Graham, American Senator Lindsey Graham, will introduce a bill that would allow the U.S. military to use force in Mexico less than a month after President Andres Manuel López Obrador moved forward with plans to nationalize Mexico's lithium. I would tell the Mexican government, if you don't clean up your act, we're going to clean it up for you. Senator Graham claims that the bill is a bill is a response to the kidnapping of four U.S. citizens in northern Mexico and so on. So there you can see, once again, human rights and democracy seem to be on the verge of visiting Mexico. Wonderful. That's how it always goes. What do we have here? Yeah, this is more. Perfect example of sanctions blowback. Indonesian President Joko Widodo urges country to abandon the use of foreign payment networks like MasterCard and Visa because we must remember we must remember the sanctions imposed by the US and Russia. Visa and MasterCard could be a problem. They should adopt India's UPI. There you go. So the whole world is now seeing how things go. This is this is not a rules-based world order. This is a whims-based world order. Whatever the US decides is, is the new rule or the new law. That's how it goes. So they may be on the verge of invading Mexico. They may, they may be preparing for that. Or they may re re remove the Mexican president, Mr. Obrador, from power because he is uh, doing things that are in... that, 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 fa that uh, prioritize na Mexi Mexico's national interest. And that's not how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to ma maximize the economic benefit for the U.S., so there we have human rights and democracy maybe on the verge of visiting Saudi Arabia, uh, Mexico, possibly other nations as well. It, it, it almost happened in, in Georgia. So everybody in the world is now seeing the pattern. And everybody realizes that the, the more you are connected to the system, the more at risk you are. So yeah, so this may be an opportunity for India to... to to promote UPI. Singapore has adopted UPI. Other nations are, many other nations are, uh, they have expressed the willingness or the wish to, to incorporate U UPI or, 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 you know, take it on. So it's, it's a good opportunity for India because India is not going to cut other countries off the way the Americans typically do. So that is about human rights and democracy. Now let's talk about uh, missiles. So, uh, the BrahMos missile is now being exported. So this is a report from last year, January. The Department of National Defense of the Philippines has acquired a bunch of cruise missiles, supersonic cruise missiles, BrahMos cruise missiles, in a deal with an Indian firm. Uh, yeah, the Indian-made BrahMos medium-range ramjet supersonic cruise missiles. Uh, so yeah. Uh, the, so this was a deal that was signed last year, and now they have they have been trained. The Philippines uh, military has been trained in the operation of the cruise missiles by Indian experts, and they have they may have already deployed the missiles. So the, when it comes to the Philippines, the major threat is China. Philippines has lots of islands that the Chinese claim and encroach upon. Philippines itself has claims in the South China Sea, the, the Champa Sea, which the Chinese dispute. The Chinese have their nine dash line, which gobbles up so much of this territory. So now you have these, these bubbles that the Philippines Navy or armed forces will be able to create using the Brahmos cruise missile. The Brahmos they are getting has a range of 300 kilometers. They have three batteries, I, I believe, if not four. Each battery has six to nine missiles. And the range of the missiles is 300 kilometers. We, we in India operate of, you know, different kinds of BrahMos missiles. The longest range is about 800 or 900 kilometers. That's what is being communicated. But the ones for export are probably the 300 kilometer range missiles. So the Philippines are now going to be able to pose serious questions to the Chinese Navy. So the Chinese Navy is no longer going to be in a position to, you know, bully the Philippines like it has been doing for the longest time. Now the Philippines have this, this cruise missile in their arsenal that can, that is, you know, very hard to stop. So it's going to be a serious challenge for the Chinese Navy. Now here's more. 
India Russia defense firm which is BrahMos eyes 200 million missile deal with Indonesia so even Indonesia is under pressure by China even Indonesian territory the Natuna Islands I believe are being claimed by the Chinese so the Indonesians may acquire the BrahMos missile so the Chinese for the longest time time have been trying to encircle India through their so-called string of pearls well we are witnessing a ring of thorns possibly being built around Chinese encroachments over here. Tit for tat. We gotta do it. So India is now playing this game. India is now an exporter of the Brahmos missile. It's a very dangerous, very deadly, very potent missile. And if Indonesia acquires it, it's going to be another challenge now for the Chinese uh, expansionist ambitions in the South China Sea region. Uh, so, Brahmos cruise missiles towards Indonesia after Philippines. India set to sign its second major defense deal. This is from March 16. So, Brahmos Aerospace is all geared to sell the Brahmos supersonic cruise missile to Indonesia. More than a year after it clinched its first ever export deal with the Philippines, uh, we're going to sell cruise missiles to Brahmos missiles for at least $200 million. At least. It could be more, depending on how much the Indonesians need. So, and, and here is another report about the same thing from the diplomat. Indonesia close to cl clinching or closing a deal for Brahmos weapons system. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's good for India. It's good for, good for all these nations that they will ha now have actual potent defenses against Chinese aggression in the South China Sea region and against their, their territorial integrity and sovereignty. Now, when we are talking about missiles, the BrahMos missile is one of the fastest cruise missiles in the world. We all obviously have the Russian Tsirkon missile, which is a hypersonic missile, Mach 8 plus. The uh, BrahMos missile has a speed of 2.8 Mach, which is 2.8 times the speed of sound. That's how fast the BrahMos missile goes. It's, it's an extremely fast missile, supersonic missile. The hypersonic range starts at Mach 5, 5 times the speed of sound. Now, here's an interesting piece of news that we have. This is new. Iran de develops hypersonic missile that breaches all defense systems. This is a news report from November 10. So, uh, these missiles will fly at more than 5 times the speed of sound. The hypersonic barrier starts at five at my, my, Mach 5. Um, so, it will be able to breach... All the systems of anti-missile defense, said the, gen the Iranian general. Uh, so that's the report we got in November last year. This is also from that time. It has built a hypersonic ballistic ballistic missile, they are saying here. Well, ballistic missiles are ex are not hypersonic. They have re-entry speeds, which is Mark 23+. plus. Ballistic missiles are a whole different beast. We're talking about cruise missiles here. So maybe this is, is not the not a very accurate report. Over here it says cruise missiles, if I'm not mistaken. Hypersonic missile. So uh, only third country with carrier killer technology. Iran claims that developing hypersonic missile uh, claims developing hypersonic missile that can hit targets with pinpoint accuracy. And and the range seems to be 1500 kilometers. So while we were we were uh, you know, tweaking the BrahMos, giving it an extended range and all that. The Iranians apparently have developed a missile which is hypersonic, which exceeds the speed of the BrahMos missile and also exceeds the range of the BrahMos missile. 1500 kilometers is a very respectable range for, for a cruise missile. So 1500 kilometers range and I'm not sure what the actual... Uh, okay, it says that it has a speed of Mark 8, 8 times the speed of sound. That's essentially unstoppable. No missile defense system that we know of can stop this missile. So the Iranians have not been sitting idle. They have developed, a, if, if these reports are correct, they have developed a very impressive and dangerous missile. It seems to be a, a, a cruise missile. With, we're quite, not quite sure here yet. But most likely, it should be a cruise missile. Otherwise, if it's a ballistic missile, it's just a short-range or medium-range ballistic missile, which is not a big deal. Looks like it's a cruise missile. So this is a wake-up call for India. We have been talking about the BrahMos and extolling its virtues for the longest time. Well, here you have the Iranians who have a hypersonic missile, Mach 8. The Russians also have a hypersonic missile, the Tsirkon. They also have something called the Kinjal. 
these are all extremely dangerous weapons and and whose capabilities are better than that of the brahmos so i think india needs to use this as a wake up call it's great to have a supersonic cruise missile but why not develop hypersonic weapons so for that you would need to use scramjet engines scramjet technology we the, the brahmos uses a ramjet engine a scramjet engine is a supersonic combusting ramjet engine so i think i mean we do have certain technology demonstrators that we have tested and all that it's time to pour some more money into these projects do more testing more rapid testing not tests once every two years and and reach the next level so i think it's it's time that india does that and i think we have some of the best missiles in the world no doubt about it especially ballistic missiles but when it comes to cruise missiles and other kinds of missiles we need to kind of catch up with nations like like russia and iran i'm not sure if the chinese have a hypersonic missile but yeah there you go so that's something we need to do we cannot just sit back and rest on our laurels we have to keep on innovating we have to remain paranoid only the paranoid survive so i hope this is a wake up call for the indian defense establishment that iranians seem to have gone ahead of us in their technological capabilities when it comes to missiles here's another piece of news inspired by seized us rq170 drone iran flaunts its new shahed 191 uav so take a look at this they have a flying wing working design of a uav with a mobile launch system which is based or which is you know it's based on a toyota tundra so the iranians acquired one of these you know american rq170 drones crashed in iran or maybe the iranians brought it down i think this was in what year was it 2011 was it which year was it it's about a decade ago that this happened so the iranians were able to acquire this drone more or less less intact and then they reverse engineered it and they have built what seems to be an almost identical copy of it so uh i would say that this is whether you know it doesn't matter where you got the technology from the design from they have been able in the course of a decade to build a working design you know prototype so and, and it and it looks like it could go into mass production soon this thing this missile that the iranians have developed so india also has this drdo ghatak program ora program whatever it is uh, we have tested a small scale version of the prototype and eventually in a few years we'll test a full scale version and it will have the indigenous manik engine or whatever india's production process design process takes too long we need to we need to catch up with these nations you know we we kind of lagging behind now the iranians have this drone it is it, i mean a flying wing design is a very is a, it's a very impressive technological advancement so we also have one but it's a it's a small scale version we still don't have the full scale version uh right so so that's the deal so the iranians have gone ahead in this and uh, we need to use this as a wake up call we cannot have these very long extended development periods with very less testing one test every every year or so or two tests a year we can't do that look at how tesla has uh, look at how spacex has innovated they do multiple tests every week every month that's how they're able to get the feedback from the design changes very rapidly and then they they change it once again and tweak it and they again test it the tests are very rapid and and lots of tests in a short time in india it's like one test a year or two tests a year it should not be like that and this is because of limited budgets we have all kinds of money to spend in other things but not where it should be spent so uh so this is something that india needs to fix and uh, we have the 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 brains the best brains in the world so why can't we you know develop the technology in better technology at a more rapid rate so that's about the the drone the the hypersonic missile that the iranians have developed now let's talk about the tejas fighter plane so india is is trying to export the tejas fighter plane to certain nations uh one of the nations it's argentina so this re- news report over here says that china argentina are on the verge of a regional region de- rattling fighter deal the uh, the the nation the argentina is reportedly weighing the jf17 fighter plane which is jointly produced by the chinese and the pakistanis 
Uh, so the Argentines may want to purchase this to modernize its Lagarde Air Force and send a shot to the US. Uh, so that is one of the aircraft they are con considering. The other aircraft they are considering is the LCA Tejas. So the Chinese fighter is reportedly competing against India's HAL Tejas, Russia's MiG-35 and second-hand Danish F-16s. So essentially, the MiG-35 is an older jet. It's an older fighter plane. The uh, JF-17 is a newer fighter plane overall. And the Tejas is obviously a brand new fighter plane. So it's it could be a two-way competition between the, uh, the between the Chinese fighter JF-17 and the LCA Tejas, Mark 1A or maybe Mark 2 or whatever, most likely Mark 1A. So that is what's happening. Now the problem is this. The Tejas has certain components that are not Indian. When it comes to the UK, the UK does not want Argentina to get any modern weaponry. All right, because they have this territorial dispute with Argentina, the Falkland Islands dispute, that which are occupied by the UK and which are right next to Argentina. So they should rightfully belong to Argentina, the Malvinas Islands, but they are occupied forcibly by the UK. So there is this territorial dispute here, and that's why the UK doesn't want Argentina's military to advance and acquire modern weapons. So the LCA Tejas has a specific component that comes from the UK. It's the ejection seat. The LCA Tejas uses the Martin Baker ejection seat, which is built by, which is uh, a, a UK company. So that is the deal. So the UK is, 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 is vetoing India, uh, offering the LCA Tejas to Argentina because it has a UK made component. So, this is something that was reported last year, mere days after the con confirmation that Argentina is interested in the HAL Tejas. India announced it will begin replacing British-made components like the tires, radar, and other parts with Indian-produced equipment to ensure a contract with Argentina. India has also announced they intend to replace the current British-made Martin Baker ejector with the Russian-produced K-36 ejector. The intent of the replacement project is to increase indigenous reliance rather than reliance on arms imports. This is from last year, August last year. Uh, yeah. And there is another report over here, which is uh, from March 12th. That's last week. India to spend a whopping $100 billion to modernize its military looks at 100% indigenization of the LCA Tejas. Now, how quickly will this happen? We don't know. Uh, it will take some time to acquire all those Russian ejector seats and replace the, the British seats with the Russian seats. I'm not sure how long it will take. So if it takes longer, then India may lose this contract, the, the Argentine contract. So what I would say is that India should acquire some Russian ejector seats. We already have the British seats. Why don't we, instead of buying them from abroad, reverse engineer them and build, build equivalent copies or better copies in India? The Chinese have done this all the time. They, they acquire systems from other countries, reverse engineer them, and then they build their own, their own versions. That's how they've built up their entire military. Why can't India do the same thing? Acquire some seeds from the UK, acquire, which we already have, get some Russian versions, and open up a couple of a couple of them, a couple of each, reverse engineer them, take them apart, let the engineers do their job, and then build Indian versions. I don't think it's very high-tech equipment and ejection seat. Obviously, it's easier said than done. Obviously, it is still high-tech. It's not cutting-edge tech. It's certainly high-tech. But it is time India does these things. So, yeah, so if we can't do this on, in time, then the Argentines would will most likely, in that case, go with the Chinese-Pakistani fighter plane, which would be a shame. Right, so that's something, again, that concerns India. What else? So last, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, I spoke about the fact that the Chinese growth story may be over. Right. So here is a news report that speaks about that. It's from the Japan Times. The Chinese century is already over. That's what it claims. So many when I when I spoke about that, I said that China is in dire straits now. It's facing a demographic disaster. Its economy is imploding. <clears throat> many people disagreed with this. And see, China is still a very large economy, the world's second largest economy. It's still a very powerful nation. Uh, 
but it faces long term problems it's china is going to remain very powerful for the next 20 or 30 years but the power is going to decline and we are seeing the signs of this already so the aging population will be a permanent drag on china's economy and its global ambitions um so here it is chinese economists have predicted that by 2049 china's per capita gdp will have reached half or even three quarters of that of the us while its overall gdp will have grown to twice or even three times that of its rival but these forecasts assume that china's population will be four times that of the us in 2049 the real figures tell a very different story assuming that china is lucky enough to stabilize its fertility rate at 1.1 children per woman which is even even that is a is is a tall order its population in in 2049 will be just 2.9 times that of the us and all its key indicators of demographic and economic vitality will be much worse so uh so in 1980 china's median age was 21 8 years younger than america's and the gdp grew at an annual rate of of 10% uh so it says china's official figures are highly exaggerated uh, china's manufacturing will continue to decline because the birth rate is crashing it is creating new inflationary pressures in the us and elsewhere uh, it says that india's population actually surpassed china's a decade ago but china did not report this china is giving out manu- you know uh, fake exaggerated official figures uh, so India remains on track to be nearly 1.5 times larger than China's population in 2050 with a median age of 39 a full generation younger than China's median age at that time China's average age will be 57 imagine the average age of your population being 57 that's what it's going to be like in 20 uh 50 so uh China is definitely investing heavily in artificial intelligence and robotics to offset the economic drag of aging but these efforts can only go so far so far because continuing innovation relies on young minds minds moreover robot workers do not consume and consumption is the major driver of any economy China's decline will be gradual it will remain the world's second or third largest economy for the for decades to come but the huge gap between its waning demographic and economic strength and its expanding political ambitions may make it highly vulnerable to strategic misjudgments i've been saying this for for a very long time memories of past glory or fear of lost status could lead uh, it down the same dangerous path that russia has taken in ukraine so overall that's what this article is telling us that the chinese century this was supposed to be china's century some were calling it the asian century not going to happen not going to happen what does it say about india what does it say about india so essentially this article says that the, if the us is overtaken as the world's largest economy it will be by india not by china if india plays its cards right china is not going to overtake the us as the world's largest economy it is not going to happen china is not going to be a superpower it's not going to happen it will for some time for maybe 20 30 years remain the second most powerful nation and second largest economy but eventually it's going to wane it's going to decline its vitality will disappear its population will become really old and india is going to overtake it and the only nation that can now overtake the us is india china is not not no longer in a position to ever overtake the us China is not going to be a superpower that dream is gone that ambition has collapsed and this makes China very dangerous for the next 20 30 years because it may indulge in some kind of misadventure so this article essentially essentially says what i've been saying for a very long time so it's the ball is now in in india's court it's for india to you know uh it is it is all up to india now whether india wants to take over china's mantle in the next 20 30 years india will have to get its priorities right india will have to get its policies right india will have to make the right moves india will have to ensure there is at least a decade minimum of peace without india getting embroiled in a major military conflict and it's going to be a tight rope walk for india but yes india can do it if it if it uh, makes the right moves if india elects the li- right leaders 
so there are dangers and there are pitfalls for india but it's a huge opportunity the only nation today in this century that can overtake the us as the biggest economy is is india so that's something we we all need to work towards the last thing i want to talk about is this give me a second so it's about india this time so this is a a graph and this gentleman says it's this is just an incredible graph india is making absolutely amazing strides against poverty poverty in retreat in retreat in india now i have spoken about something that happened in 2016 which was demonetization this obviously is not connected to that it may it may be connected to some extent i have spoken about the impact that india's demonetization had on pakistan so in 2016 india's uh, population that was living in extreme poverty was 124 million almost 10 8 9% of india's population that's an enormous figure and see where it is today 15 million 15 india has brought almost 110 million people out of extreme poverty in just 6 years that is a staggering achievement incredible incredible achievement by india by the current government of india the narendra modi government who else here is a more complete picture of how extreme poverty has gone down in india so here you will see the details the the dark red over here is the percentage of india that's living in extreme poverty it was about 140 million or so uh one second so yeah 2016 so this tells you that the breakup of the entire thing so even today if you look at the people who are living above 40 a day that's a very very small number of people but overall what you would call the middle class is growing and you are seeing after 2010 maybe after 2016 how suddenly everything has changed drastically and this has been achieved despite the terrible hardship that the world underwent because of the coronavirus pandemic when entire nations were under lockdown including india it was very hard for india and india's people and despite this the government ensured that everybody is taken care of and look at the results we have brought people out of extreme poverty and yeah so there are there are details about all that over here so as you can see if india in india has the ability to solve its problems india is the only nation that can overtake the us in this century india actually is is on track for doing that in the next 20 30 years if india's growth continues at 6 7 8 percent per year around that figure for the next 20 or 30 years india will overtake the us as the largest economy but for that to happen a lot of things need to go right including uh, the right leadership has to be in po- in power in india the right people have to be elected the right uh the right policies have to be in place and india has to ensure that india does not get embroiled in a major military conflict at least for the next 10 years minimum ideally 20 years like bruce lee said if you want to fight the best way of fighting is to fight without fighting it's to win without ever firing a single shot so that that's what india needs to find a way of doing so the future looks bright for india it's going to take time it's not going to happen overnight there are lots of problems there are nations very powerful nations we know the usual suspects suspects who don't want india to do well who don't want india to become a challenger in the future and they will do their best they will do their best to create trouble in india that's where we started this podcast this this episode and that's where we end so and you know it's a big challenge for india and that's what makes life interesting and worthwhile taking on a big challenge and striving to achieve it if there are no big challenges life is dull and boring so there's this huge opportunity for india huge challenge for india and everybody can contribute in their own way so the future could be bright so let's conclude this this episode of the indian interest on that note thank you very much for watching and i will see you in tomorrow's live stream less than 24 hours from now until there until then take care thank you for watching and i'll see you soon bye